mysterious and powerful. Feared and worshipped by mankind. There are only a few places left to admire it like this. It offers protection and still wakes our primeval fears. How has our relationship to darkness changed? And how much time is left to us to enjoy this beauty? In search of the secrets and mysteries of the night, we explore a world full of magical moments far away from the cities and towns. The day is drawing to a close. As the light begins to drain away, dusk is upon us. It won't be long now before the other half of the day begins. The back and forth between light and darkness has been influencing the day-night rhythm of all living things for millions of years. A never-ending cycle. Every night, we look up into a sea of a thousand stars. Looking at stars also means looking into the past, because the light of the stars that our eyes see today started its journey to us many thousands of years ago. The starry nights and the stars are really important, but I think the moon is also really incredibly significant. Incredibly significant. It played a fundamental role before artificial light in determining what we could do uh, about shipping movements, about a whole range of different things. There is some evidence to suggest that up to a third of all British households had a moon almanac. That is where they could actually read about and, and, and know about the various movements of the moon and the cycles of the moon because it was so important. It was so important for travel. It was so important for entertainment. You wouldn't hold a big soiree on when there's, when there's going to be no moon, that you would know you would have to do it at a time where you had this extra artificial light in the sky. The moon plays a unique role in life on Earth. It illuminates the night. The gravitational pull between Earth and its moon governs the tides, and it slows down Earth's rotation. Without the moon, the day would not be 24 hours long, but only eight. Even the genesis of the moon is proof of the close connection between the moon and Earth. 4.5 billion years ago, the protoplanet Theia crashed into the proto-Earth, Gaia, creating millions of pieces of debris. The idea is that about 4.5 billion years ago, there was a giant protoplanet which crashed into the proto-Earth, Gaia. The result of this was, was on one part the debris that was put into the space and was reunited to the moon, which is probably part of the Earth. The other part is the axis of the Earth is tilted, which now is about 23.44 degrees. The result of this tilted axis of the Earth is that we have seasons. Except for at the equator and in the tropics, there are four seasons everywhere on the planet. The Earth's axis is tilted by about 23.4 degrees. And this tilt is the main reason we have four seasons. The sun's rays hit the Earth at different angles. Depending on how they fall, the days are shorter or longer. 
The seasons, and therefore the times at which the sun rises and sets, are dependent on the tilt of the rotation axis of the Earth. Dusk becomes darkness. An especially beautiful sight in the mountains. As soon as the sun goes down in the west, a greyish blue arc can be observed in the east. It's called the shadow of the earth. Due to the fact that the last rays of the sun no longer reach every layer of the atmosphere, the horizon appears darker. The blue hour sets the stage for the night. the light of the moon, all the creatures we rarely encounter during the day are out and about. And now, the nocturnal forest dwellers are taking the stage. In the course of evolution, their senses have adapted to the dark of the night. Bats use ultrasound echoes to navigate through the darkness. Hedgehogs, on the other hand, find their prey with the help of a keen sense of smell. But all the other creatures that are active at night possess special abilities. The natural cycle of day and night influences the lives of all animals and humans. This also includes their sleep. At night or during the day, sleep is vital for every living being. We see animals like dolphins or sharks or migrating birds, that they sleep with just one hemisphere at a time and then they switch the hemisphere and the other hemisphere goes into sleep. But what we see bottom line is every animal needs to sleep. So it's a very central thing in nature. And we need to recognize that sleep is so important, like eating or drinking, that we should really take good care that we have a stable sleep. Humpback whales are at home in the world's oceans. During their migrations across the globe, these gentle giants of the sea can travel thousands of kilometers. In contrast to humans, whales breathe consciously, which makes sleeping shorter and more challenging for them. Several times a day, they assume a vertical sleeping position for a maximum of 30 minutes. During this so-called slow wave sleep, one brain hemisphere is awake and can concentrate on breathing, and the other half can rest. Trees also have a day-night rhythm. Charles Darwin was one of the first to claim that plants also sleep at night. Researchers from the Vienna University of Technology and Budapest University are working together to understand the sleep rhythm of trees. During the course of an entire night, Andrei Schlinski and Gerhard Pürscher will be measuring two birch trees and attempting to discern a sleep pattern. Obviously, for humans, sleep is a different state of consciousness compared to being awake. We don't know whether trees have consciousness or don't. Um, so this is definitely an analogy. The reason for using this word is that it comes directly from Charles Darwin. Darwin uh, wrote his last book on the movement of plants. And he observed and defined several different ways of plant movement, flowers opening and closing and so on. And one of the movements he observed was the leaves of specific trees closing during the night and then opening in the morning. And he called this sleep. The scientists are measuring the trees with the help of laser scanners all night long. The experiment starts at sunset. Billions of infrared rays of light are projected onto the botanical test subjects. The leaves reflect the light, which is invisible to humans. The 
This process is repeated every 30 minutes until dawn breaks. And now the researchers can begin to analyze almost two billion measurement points. In this manner, they're able to prove the nocturnal movement of the trees. In the course of the day, trees evaporate liquid through minute openings in their leaves during photosynthesis. Without sunlight at night, these pores close. The water pressure sinks, starting in the trunk and then in the branches. The extent to which the branches and leaves sag because of this process is barely visible to the naked eye. But the measurements show, during the course of the night, the leaves and branches have dipped down around 20 centimeters. The trees lay down to sleep, so to speak. And with the break of day and the rising sun, the birch tree stretches its branches upwards again. The damp forests and caves of New Zealand are home to spectacular animals, which are a strange sight to see during the day. These are the larva of the fly known as a fungus gnat. They produce silk threads with their mouths. What these threads do only becomes clear in the dark. These glowworms are superstars in New Zealand. They have the unique ability to produce a blue-green light, a tail light, so to speak. And they use this light to attract insects. To catch their prey, the glowworms set up a nest with a snare of sticky silk threads. And the result is a spectacle of nature. A twinkling glow like a thousand starry nights covers the inside of the Waitemo Caves. Magical natural phenomena like these have been captivating people throughout the ages. The magic of the night is something I enjoy immensely. I always think about how people in the generations before us that lived many centuries ago must have experienced it, like a sign from God or the gods. There are many myths and legends surrounding the nocturnal power of nature. One of the earliest reports of the Northern Lights was made in China 3,000 years before the birth of Christ. It stated that the shining mysterious lights in the night sky had induced an imperial pregnancy. And the Vikings believed that the Northern Lights were a manifestation of their gods. Other Nordic tribes, however, considered them to be a bad omen. Today we know that the sun casts electrically charged particles into space. If they get close to Earth, they are pulled by our planet's magnetic field towards the poles. And when the charged particles then collide with air particles, they light up the sky. These lights guide us through the darkness. Many of them are architectural masterpieces. Lighthouses. Their beacons are there to help humans in the night when their eyes can barely see. The most powerful of them cast their light out up to 60 kilometers across the ocean in good visibility. For centuries, beacons have been helping seafaring folk find their way through the dark nights and rough seas. And ever since the 17th century, sailors have been telling tales of the mysterious phenomena they encountered in the darkness of the night, where the seas suddenly begin to glow. Especially in warm and windless summer nights, a glowing natural spectacle like no other can unfold. Marine phosphorence transforms the ocean into a magical place.
But it's not the ocean that is glowing, but billions of tiny unicellular organisms. They are the fireflies of the sea. These microorganisms are capable of producing their very own luminescent material for a short period of time. External stimuli, like waves, or your feet in the water, cause the little animals to glow. Mother Nature's spectacular light show. The night represents a time of play, a time of risk. For some people, it's a time of escape. It's all of these things and more. But we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that the night still retains certain charms, still retains a, a very strong sense of leisure and fun as well. But nighttime is also showtime. Nighttime sporting events have become a centerpiece of modern life. Light suits turn simple skiers into radiant beings. Their light suits illuminate the snow-covered mountains. Over 6,000 LED lights were skillfully woven together to make this high-tech outwear. Technology meets Mother Nature. We are not masters in night vision, but very skilled indeed when it comes to lighting up the night. The result is a sight to see. A spectacular show. Fireworks have been enchanting people around the world for centuries. Their origins can be traced back to China. 1400 years ago, it is said that a monk named Li Tan built the first fireworks to banish the demons that had been bewitching the weather for months. Today, people all over the world take delight in the colorful rockets in the night sky for celebrations of all kinds, transforming entire landscapes into a magical ocean of sparkling lights. Fireworks came to Europe in the Baroque period and became very popular with the aristocracy. They loved the sparkling lights in the sky, which would sometimes be accompanied by music. It was really an aristocratic, an elitist form of entertainment. It was expensive and therefore a status symbol. It was a demonstration of the power to be able to do it and of being allowed to do it. We can no longer imagine our lives without artificial light. And it is in darkness that we notice how important it has become for us. Seeing without light is a major challenge for the human eye. As long as we have daylight, we are able to see all the colors that our world has to offer. When darkness falls, however, our ability to see changes rapidly. Light reaches the retina through the eye. There, various photoreceptors transform the optical signals into electric impulses. 
These cones are the receptors responsible for color vision. There are three different types of cones, but they all contain photoreceptor proteins that absorb light of different wavelengths. These three different bands of the wavelengths correspond to the colors red, green, and blue. When the lights are on, seven million cones let us see the world in color. On the other hand, 120 million rods differentiate between light and dark. When we enter into darkness, the overall sensitivity of the visual system increases. Within a few minutes time, the sensitivity of the cones increases a thousandfold. The eye then switches to rod vision. After approximately half an hour, the eye has become completely adapted to the darkness. Now, we perceive only shades of gray. The human eye is, is, is highly adaptive. It's easy for us to see when there's a blue sky in summer during the day and when there's full moon or half moon. It's really adaptive and it really helps that this eye can translate very low intensities into vision. But it comes with a limit that we are not as able to see at night as we are at daytime. So we need artificial light to allow for the same illuminance, for the same vision as during the day. This is why we are diurnal and not nocturnal, to some extent at least. Um, because like cats, for example, who can extract much more from dim light activities, for, for, for cats it's much brighter at night than for us humans. This is why we are not that suitable to live through the, through the night without artificial light. Wildcats have been living in the forests of Europe for over 300,000 years. They were brought to the brink of extinction through overhunting and the destruction of their habitat. Today, they can be found all across Europe, from Scotland all the way to the south and on the Black Sea coast, widely scattered in most cases. In Spain, however, wildcats live almost everywhere. And in Germany, the number of wildcats has been rising constantly. Humans are the biggest threat to wildcats. The human settlement of Europe, the settlement with towns and cities, with roads and railroad tracks, and the intense agriculture destroyed much of the wildcats' habitat. They feel most at home in large contiguous woodlands. The Shylonas stalk their prey on velvet paws. European wildcats prefer to live in mixed and broadleaf forested areas with clearings or glades. The wildcat's sense of sight is so sharp that it prefers to hunt at dusk or at night. Its vision system is especially adapted to the dark. In low light conditions, the cat's pupil dilates three times more than a human eye. This allows more light to reach the retina. And not unlike humans, a cat's retina also contains cones and rods. The difference is that the cat possesses far more rods than a human. The cones are the receptors responsible for color vision. Rods are used for night vision. Cats have a mirror-like layer behind the retina which is called tapetum lucidum, or bright tapestry in English. It reflects visible light back through the retina, acting as a kind of residual light amplifier. This means that the photoreceptors are hit twice, on the way into and out of the eye.
This is why cat's eyes shine at night when they are hit with light. Nocturnal animals can be highly adaptable. Due to mild winters and plenty of food, the wild boar population has soared in the last few years, for example. And the problems associated with them are increasing as well. There is plenty of farmland located right in the midst of large forested areas nowadays, the habitat of these animals. Dawn sheds light on what these bristly omnivores can do to a farmer's fields. In order to find a way out of this dilemma between humans and animals, the scientist Elisa Klamm and her team are researching the movement patterns of wild boars in the Heinisch National Park in Germany. But to do this, the animals must first be fitted with GPS transmitters. Well, the reasons for the project are on one hand that we want to take a closer look at the behavior of the wild boar in this region, and we also want to understand their pack structure better. There's a constant conflict between the wild boar. They can do a lot of damage to agricultural fields, and there's a conflict with the hunters. This is the case in Germany and surely in other countries as well. And the reason for starting a project like this is to take a look at the individual relationships and figure out what the wild boar do all day long and especially at night. It's only after dark that the wild boars really get going. The boars prefer mixed forests with plenty of undergrowth and lots of water. Boars are typically social animals, living in large family groups, which are also called sounders. There is a strict hierarchy within the female-dominated groups, with the alpha female at the very top. In contrast to other wild animals, wild boars have very bad vision, but they still see better at night than humans. They have an excellent sense of smell that helps their orientation, helping them find their way at night and to locate sources of food. And food is exactly what these researchers have put out in their attempt to lure the animals into this trap. A trailer set up nearby serves as the command center as they wait for the wild boars. From here, they can watch the nocturnal hustle and bustle on a monitor. And the camera shows us there are plenty of other animals out and about besides the boars. Will this long wait be worth it? The trapdoor falls and the animals can now be tagged. The interesting thing about wild boar research is that every animal has its own personality. The telemetry data shows us that you just can't say that all the animals leave the national park or that certain groups of animals only stay out in the fields. It can really be quite different. The results of the project show the movement patterns in the southern part of the national park. The tracks of 10 wild boars over a period of three months. Whereas seven of 10 wild boars hardly ever leave their habitat, three go on long journeys every night. They roam around in circles of up to 30 kilometers away. This is evidence that could make peaceful coexistence between humans and animals possible. These findings can be used to take action that minimize the damage caused by the boars and to bring more peace to the sometimes troubled relationship between farmers and nocturnal animals. And while the boars primarily cause trouble after sunset, other creatures of the night have long been considered bearers of bad luck. Pitch black nights have always filled people with fear and terror. The scariest stories always seem to take place at remote locations like forests and craggy cliffs. 
I think it makes sense that the night is very much associated with fear historically, largely because of darkness. We know from various social historians and from anthropologists that universally there are concerns and anxieties about the night. There are various beasts, various mythological creatures that come out at night simply because it's dark and we don't know what's out there. Dark forests are home to many nocturnal animals, like this eagle owl family. The baby owls are only able to fly on their own after about 10 weeks. Until then, its parents have to hunt for its food night upon night, and they are practically noiseless while doing so. Seeing this, it's hard to believe that in the ancient world, they were considered to be birds of the dead and bearers of bad tidings. In days gone by, they were even nailed alive to barns as protection against hail, fire, and witchcraft. At night, many things take on a very different meaning. The night triggers our fantasy because it's typically a time of reflection. It's a time when we're not working. It's a time perhaps when we have a greater amount of time to actually reflect upon ourselves and upon uh, our relations with other people as well. Scary fairy tales about witches are often set in hard to reach places like high up in the mountains or deep in the forest. And there, hidden away where no one can find them, witches have supposedly been holding demonic dance rituals for centuries that always take place in the middle of the night. And then once a year, the witches' gatherings culminate in Valpurgis night celebrations, where the sorceresses consummate or renew their pact with the devil. Valpurgis night owes its name to Saint Valburga, an educated abbess from England, who was credited with multiple healings. She was canonized on the 1st of May in the year 1870. Christian celebrations and pagan rituals come together in the Valpurgis night. Even the Celts and Germanic tribes used spring bonfires to drive out the evil spirits of winter. But it's not only long cold nights, witches and wizards that strike fear in the hearts of mankind. Natural phenomena that we can't explain make us shudder as well. To this day, thunderstorms give rise to fear in our hearts, and it gets even worse at night. In the mountains, severe summer storms can feel particularly ominous, especially when storm clouds can rage in a valley for hours. Warm, humid air rises quickly up the sides of the mountains, which allows thunderstorms to form more easily. Thunder and lightning has always played a major role in the history of humanity. It was lightning that most likely brought fire to prehistoric people, which allowed them to learn how to control it. In many cultures around the globe, people worship a thunder god. It is these gods, like Zeus or Thor, who cast bolts of lightning and caused the thunder to roll down upon us. Lightning as a sign of God's wrath. It is said that the reformer Martin Luther believed that as well. As a bolt of lightning struck the ground near him, so the story goes, he called out in fear to St. Anne, vowing to become a monk. The fear of the power of nature and long winter nights, we push back against it as people, celebrating the light 
as often as we can. As soon as the longest night of the year is upon us, we know that the long dark winter nights will soon become shorter again. With the winter solstice, the light in the northern hemisphere starts to increase. Even the early Germanic tribes celebrated the winter solstice for several nights with their Yule Fest. Today, the word Yule is used to describe Christmas in Scandinavia, a reminder of the Germanic custom. On December the 25th, the Romans celebrated a god called Sol Invictus, or the Invincible Sun God. In antiquity, it was the date of the winter solstice when light takes back the upper hand against darkness. The 25th of December is also considered to be the birthday of Jesus Christ. To honor him, the Roman Emperor Constantine established a feast day. Ever since the 4th century, Christmas and the winter solstice fell on the same day. That only changed with the introduction of the Gregorian calendar. The longest night of the year now falls on the 21st or 22nd of December. The oldest reference of a Christmas tree is in the 16th century. People were said to have set up small Christmas fir trees on the marketplaces of Alsace. This practice pleased so many people that there were soon many imitators. Today, of course, the Christmas tree is a perennial bestseller. In Christendom, the night is somewhat ambiguous, that on the one hand, there is a very strong association between the night and sin and depravity. Jesus, of course, came here to bring light to the world. Uh, God brought light to the world as well. So the light becomes associated with everything good. The night becomes associated with everything that's basically evil or bad. During the winter solstice and the summer solstice, southern England's most famous location, Stonehenge, transforms into a pilgrimage site like no other for the self-proclaimed druids, hippies and tourists. The monument dates back to the Stone Age. In the course of its construction history, Stonehenge was probably first used to determine the solstice around 4,600 years ago. The entrance points towards a rough-hewn stone outside the circle, above which the sun rises at the summer solstice and sets during the winter solstice. When the longest day of the year meets the shortest night, the young men from the villages around Wachstein Mountain are faced with a test of courage. They climb up steep, rocky paths to reach the summit. They undertake this trek to light a fire up there in the dark as a symbol of light and of life. The people here have been celebrating the summer solstice like this for hundreds of years. Through Christianization, what was once possibly a pagan tradition came to be called St. John's Eve. Either way, the fires are meant to ward off bad harvests, sickness and demons. The fires glow along the ridges of Waxenstein Mountain like fireflies in the night sky. And this is what they look like in the wild. They are responsible for the magic glow of warm summer nights. Seen during the day, 
they look pretty unremarkable, but when darkness falls, they morph into brilliant fireflies. Their secret? The insects produce their own light. A chemical reaction releases energy in the small body that it then emits in the form of light. Another example of bioluminescence. And the more beautifully the fireflies glow, the more success they have with members of the opposite sex. The Käfer have their to a large extent, these beetles have eliminated the scents that other insects utilize to find a partner and are really concentrating on using light signals to find each other. But their happiness is only short-lived. Even as they complete their lovemaking, their lights go out. The male dies soon after mating. The female follows him a few days later. She lays her eggs shortly before her death. Fireflies become active naturally when the light intensity sinks below a certain level. They have eyes that can deal very well with the minimal natural light available at night, and they produce their own light for communication. That means when artificial light illuminates the night, this interferes with the lightning bug, or they simply don't become active at all. The night has much more than just optical treats to offer. Nocturnal animals harmonize on summer nights to produce a natural symphony. In spring and summer, the meadows are home to a wide range of chirps and twitters. The shy field cricket is famous for its music. Jens Esser is an insect researcher. He studies these sound artists with their powerful voices. However, only male crickets sing, the females stay silent. The main reason why they are nocturnal is simply that there are far fewer predators active then. Birds, except for a few exceptions, are active during the day, and the male field crickets, who call attention to themselves with their loud chirping, are able to enjoy the protection of the night's darkness. The male field cricket chirps for a variety of reasons. They get especially loud when it comes to defending their territory. But they get even more creative when trying to get the attention of females. He then sits down in front of his freshly dug living quarters and waits for that special someone to come by and then tries to win her over with a mating call. The males don't have a lot of time. They want to mate, and the females want to as well. They want to deposit their eggs. The process is time critical. A dating game with a highly sophisticated chirping technique. Crickets play the violin with their right wing. The bottom of a cricket's right wing is covered with 140 teeth-like ridges. When the cricket rubs this scraper part of its right wing against the left wing underneath it, the result is a chirping sound. Kind of like when you move a fine tooth comb over a table edge. This soft chirping is transmitted to membranes in the wings, which when lifted up, act as an amplifier and send the sound waves out into the surrounding area across distances of up to 50 meters. Artificial light is used at night almost everywhere around the world to give nature a helping hand. Greenhouses are used to increase the daylight hours and accordingly the growth phases of plants. These glass houses are also a major factor in light pollution. This artificial lighting at night interferes with our view of the stars, creates longer working hours, and through this even interferes with people's sleep that live and work in the countryside. 
It is the middle of the night, and this farmer's fields are still humming with activity. The powerful headlights of the combined harvester light up the fields. They are threshing wheat and oats. There is usually only a very narrow window of time available for the harvest, due to the fact that the crops must be reaped as soon as they reach their ideal maturity. And sometimes, a few days' time is all that is available to get this done. The weather has to be just right, and that is why the harvesters work around the clock to bring in the crops before the next spell of bad weather hits. In the periods before we had electric light, moonlight was actually a really important source of light. So for example, they might have done activities like harvesting during the moon, which is why in English, in the fall, when the, when the days after the full moon, the moon rises very high, we call that the harvest moon. It was a time when people would use that moonlight in order to extend their activity into the night. And so it's reasonable to believe that before electric lighting, uh, cycles of moonlight probably played a much bigger role in terms of human activity. Middleburg in the German state of Saxony-Anhalt. In 1999, treasure hunters hit the jackpot, uncovering one of the most significant archaeological finds of the 20th century, the Nebra Sky Disk. It shows the oldest concrete representation of astronomical phenomena in the world. On the lower edge of the bronze disk, a sunboat is portrayed on its journey across the night sky. The gold arches on the left and right represent the horizon. 32 stars can be seen, as well as the sun and the moon in their orbits. A close cluster of seven dots likely represents the Pleiades. Once this cluster of stars disappeared from the nighttime sky in the west, Farmers knew it was time to start planting their seeds. The Nebra Sky Disk, a 3,600-year-old farmer's almanac. I think at the time uh, when we first started to have societies or first live in groups, we had a lot of time to kill in the evening when the sun went down. So we would sit around the campfire and you would look up at the sky. That was, that was like a movie. It was something to look at, something to see. And uh, the stars were also critically important uh, for knowing things like when to plant, uh, which direction north was. Uh, there's a saying from, from years ago uh, that astronomers can never get lost because they can always find north. It's a bit of a problem if it's cloudy, but it, it makes sense. So the stars were, were really critically important to humans in the past. And that's probably why we have so many stories and uh, so, many, so much art that's related to the stars. The Big Dipper is one of the most well-known constellations and can always be seen in the skies of the Northern Hemisphere. In Germany, it's known as the Big Wagon, and people there tell the myth of the Hackelberg hunter to go with it. He's fatally wounded by a wild boar during a hunt. Hackelberg's last will. His favorite horse should bring him to his final resting place. But the horse bolts, taking the wagon and Hackelberg with it. And since then, he is unable to find peace and wanders restlessly through the heavens. People read all sorts of things into a whole range of different objects. We try to make meaning out of entrails or, or dice or, or cards. But there is something uniquely interesting about the night sky and how fascinating that must have been for our ancestors as well, who all of us, look up to, to the sky and we make meaning out of that and we try to, to understand this. And we're really into constellations and, and, and the importance of, of astrology. And before really knowing what a comet was, it must have been absolutely extraordinary to look up and see comets and, and shooting stars. And the meaning of that is, uh, and the significance of that must have been really quite fascinating.
On certain summer nights, just before sunrise, noctilucent clouds can be observed in the sky. Bright, silvery blue, atmospheric phenomena, which are visible at an altitude of about 80 kilometers. The omnipresence of artificial light only allows us rare looks at a proper night sky. But in the countryside, far away from the cities and towns, it is still possible to enjoy this magnificent sight at a few remaining places on the planet. Many children growing up today never have never experienced seeing the Milky Way in the sky and seeing what a real natural sky looks like. And I think that's a, a real loss of an experience that was part of human culture for the, our entire evolution and our entire development uh, into the society we have today. So I think we're losing that connection to the wonder and the mystery of the universe by, by not seeing this. The magic of the night ends with the rising of the sun. Day is breaking, and now we are again governed by its rules. The never-ending cycle of day and night begins anew.